Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So until now we have been talking about the different aspects of cell when it comes to tissue homeostasis. So we talked about cell growth, death, differentiation. So there are just two more concepts when it comes to cells. Uh, the first is adhesion and the next one is migration. So we will talk about uh, cell adhesion today. So understanding cell adhesion is crucial when it comes to tissue engineering because uh, you need to know how you can design your scaffolds in a way that you will be able to uh, help cells to adhere. So you need to identify what type of cell you are going to work with, try to understand how those cells interact with each other and with the matrix and how they adhere to these surfaces. Based on that you can actually functionalize your material to get desirable adhesion properties. So uh, when you talk about cell adhesion there are the aspects which you need to understand are uh, the concept of the surface receptors. So each uh, type of cell could have different surface receptors which help in cell adhesion. So these receptors usually have an extracellular domain which is the one which interacts with the surface or other cells and you have a transcellular domain and an intracellular domain. So through which signals and other cascades can actually be triggered. So you also have cell to cell adhesion where uh, cells of similar kind or different kind adhere to each other using some of these receptors and uh, form different junctions or you could have cell to matrix adhesions. So it is important to know the difference between the two and they usually are uh, uniquely different. Some types of jun uh, junctions are more commonly seen in cell to cell interactions whereas others are more commonly seen in uh, cell to matrix interactions. So when you are talking about the mechanics of cell adhesion itself, there, are, there can be non-specific physical forces such as electrostatic or uh, aesthetic repulsion or van der Waals forces which could play a role when it comes to interaction of cells. So when you are talking about electrostatic adhesion, electrostatic forces, the cell-cell interaction uh, can basically have a negative effect because you can have a repulsion because there would be a negative charge on the cell surface on both the cells. So which could have a negative, uh, which could have repulsive properties in when it comes to electrostatic forces. Whereas when, it are, when you are talking about cell surface interaction, you can try to use this to your advantage. If you have a negatively charged surface, then you can induce repulsion of the cells. Whereas if you have a positively charged surface, you could actually attract the cells towards the surface. So steric repulsion is basically uh, seen, yeah. Sir, if naturally two cells uh, both have negative charges and repel each other, like how do they uh, Yeah, it depends on uh, how far away they are and uh, which forces actually uh, have the biggest uh, impact. So it is not going to be one force which is acting, right. So you have electrostatic forces, steric repulsion, van der Waals forces and then you have the specific interactions between because of the ligand receptor interactions. So based on the distance at which they are present and based on the affinity of these um, like the dissociation constants or the affinity constants of these forces, you would actually have uh, interactions. So we will talk about that. So each of them would have their own uh, properties. So steric repulsion is basically uh, seen when a cell approaches an adhesion site, what happens is water is excluded, therefore uh, membrane bound proteins become concentrated which causes a repulsive osmotic force. So the compression of the membrane bound proteins initiate an additional repulsive force which is seen uh, as the steric repulsion. So again all these forces are more active when the dif distance between the two surfaces which are interacting, it could be both cell surfaces or a uh, matrix surface and a cell surface is at different levels. At some particular uh, distances you would have electrostatic effect having a bigger role whereas at some other distance it will be steric repulsion. 
So, this uh, the last non specific physical force is Van der Waals forces. So, attractive charge interactions between uh, polarizable but uncharged molecules is uh, called as Van der Waals uh, interactions, and this is significant when the distance is greater than 20 nanometers uh, and it is less important when uh, it is very close because the other factors actually play a bigger role. So, this graph which is seen here. Uh, the graph you observe here the interaction potential versus uh, separation distance. This graph shows you uh, how the overall effect of all these three are. So, this is not individual effects this is a uh, cumulative effect of these three uh, uh, non specific physical forces. So, electrostatic and steric repulsions uh, are seen when the cells are farther away and you have the receptor ligand binding which can have a significant uh, impact and Van der Waals binding which would have a lesser impact. Okay. So, uh, the specific physical forces uh, unlike the non specific ones are the receptor ligand adhesions. So, this depends on what surface and what are the ligands present and what cell and what are the receptors present. Okay. So, the strength is uh, much higher when it compares to when it is compared to other non physical forces again it, this is not a chemical bond which is being formed it is a still a physical interaction. However, uh, the binding is very strong it overcomes all the other repulsive non specific forces when this happens because it is much much stronger than all the other forces put together. So, the specificity also provides uh, ways to bind specific cells to matrix uh, to the matrix. So, uh, you could uh, have some cells adhere to a surface whereas, other cells might not actually like the surface as much. So, depending on the receptors which are exp expressed you can actually tailor your material in a way that uh, the specific cell types are adhered to the surface. So, yeah. No, in general even in uh, nature. So, if you have an extracellular matrix the interaction is going to still be there right. Like, uh, why are we talking about like distance between the cells like in natural tissues like is there a distance between two cells? Yeah, yeah because the cells it is not that the cells are always present there and they are proliferating right. So, cells could have would have to migrate from uh, the stem cell niche and come to a specific site and at that so there will be factors which will play a role. So, it, it would uh, have an impact uh, even in natural conditions and it will be crucial to understand that to exploit it in tissue engineering applications. Okay. Okay, so, uh, this uh, receptor ligand binding actually controls the binding strength and the binding persistence uh, because there are limited number of receptors and ligands uh, on the surface. So, uh, based on that you can actually regulate how strong it is and uh, where it actually binds and so on. So, uh, when we talk about cell adhesion in general we usually are talking about this ligand receptor uh, binding. So, th this reversible association of protein receptors in the membrane to the complementary uh, ligands which could be present on the surface or on another cell is what we talk about when you talk about cell adhesion. So, this is what you would have uh, studied when you studied cell biology right. So, I hope you were taught cell adhesion as part of cell biology. So, it is actually an important aspect when it comes to cells. So, uh, that when we talk about that from a biological perspective this is what we are talking about. So, if you are looking at it from a chemical standpoint the, the uh, it is again similar to the ligand receptor binding which we looked at when we talked about growth factors uh, earlier right. So, what would happen is it is the ligand and receptor forming a complex for, uh, and this would be obviously a reversible reaction because it is a uh, specific physical force, but it is a reversible process. So, there would be a dissociation constant and an association constant and uh, if the dissociation constant is very high then uh, the affinity is lesser if the dissociation constant is low the affinity is much better. So, the uh, interaction would be much stronger. Okay. So, this shows you the association and dissociation constants for uh, different ligand receptor complexes. So, you can see that uh, these are classified based on the type of uh, junctions or 
uh, additions which would be done. So, integrins is one aspect and you would see so uh, one type. So, integrins you see fibrinogen uh, interacting with alpha 2 b uh, beta 3 receptor and you see that the dissociation constant is really, really small. Right. So, that shows that there is a significant in a significantly strong interaction. There would be some which are not that strong. So, if you were to take selectins where glycam 1 and L selectin, its uh, dissociation constant is not that small, it is uh, orders of magnitude higher. So, indicating that it is much weaker. So, uh, there are other things which are as close to even uh, covalent bonds like the biotin avidin complex. So, biotin avidin complex is as strong as a covalent bond. So, the dissociation constant is about 10 power minus 15. Okay. So, uh, understanding these things can actually help because uh, specific cell types will uh, actually express specific surfaces, uh, sorry, surface receptors, right. So, we would know. So, base uh, fibroblast cell surface will uh, have receptors which will bind with R G D that is known. So, if you can tailor your material to have RGD, then your fibroblasts can be recruited. So, similarly you would have to figure out what would be the suitable ligand for different uh, cells which you are working with. So, if you have a uh, bone tissue engineering in your mind, you need to figure out what receptor osteoblasts would like and try to modify your uh, surfaces with that. Hopefully, that will help you. Uh, Help in, uh, help in making sure that more uh, bone cells are attached to the surface. Okay. So, as I already mentioned uh, affinity is represented by the dissociation constant. Uh, this is the, the dissociation constant is basically numerically equal to the ligand concentration required to achieve 50 percent receptor binding. So, this is like your Michaelis Menten uh, constant. right? So, that is the 50 percent of your reaction rate is achieved uh, at a particular substrate concentration that is your K m. So, similarly uh, the numerical value at which you can get 50 percent uh, receptor binding is uh, the ligand concentration uh, is, is the dissociation constant. So, uh, this varies between 10 power minus 6 to 10 power minus 12 molars. So, 10 power minus 6 is considered to be low affinity versus uh, 10 power minus 12 is considered to be much higher affinity. So, to predict the strength of specific cell addition by multiple non-covalent bonds, the tensile strength of the receptor ligand bonds uh, has to be estimated. So, basically to see how strong this binding is, there are experiments to do this, there are many studies. So, um, like, uh, there I will I will give you a reference which you can go through. So, that discusses some of the experiments that can be done to study uh, the receptor ligand um, strength, binding strength. So, the strength of the affinity bond uh, relates to the standard free energy uh, which is delta G dot uh, G naught and uh, the bond length. So, what is this delta G? What is Gibbs free energy? at least the ones who are studying thermodynamics this semester. Just 110 of the process. That is the outcome, that is how you, I am so if your Gibbs free energy is negative then the reaction will happen spontaneously, that is fine. But what is Gibbs free energy? Your quiz 2 would have gotten over just now, right? I am pretty sure you would have covered Gibbs free energy. Yeah. What is Gibbs free energy? You studied Gibbs free energy, yes. right? Yeah. So, what is it? Okay. So, that is one aspect. So, in general, this is a thermodynamic potential. Basically, it is a thermodynamic potential and uh, it measures the useful or process initiating work obtainable from a thermodynamic system. So, it could be a reaction or any other process. Okay. Yeah, like reaction is what we commonly look at when we talk about uh, Gibbs free energy. So, we always try to associate it with that, but it is not necessary that it needs to be for that. So, Gibbs free energy is the capacity of a system to do non-mechanical work and uh, delta G basically measures this non-mechanical work done on the system. Okay. 
anyway. So, uh, the standard free energy can actually be calculated from the binding constants. So, uh, you would get delta G naught equals k t ln of uh, k a by k naught. Okay. So, uh, k a here is the binding constant and k naught is the bi uh, binding constant at a standard condition usually uh, 1 mole inverse and k is the Boltzmann's constant and t is the absolute temperature. So, bond length is assumed to be greater than the uh, size of the individual weak bonds within the binding site and less than the size of the binding site itself. So, it will be somewhere in between. Okay. So, using this you can calculate the free energy from which you will have an understanding of uh, what would be the strength of the bond affinity. Okay. So, uh, coming back to the biology aspect of this. So, uh, cell junctions are created when we talk about cell adhesions. The binding of cell surface receptors to complementary ligands uh, is the process in which uh, there is association between the cell and uh, external stimuli. External stimuli could be cells materials or uh, so cells matrix or foreign objects. So, our scaffold would be technically a foreign object right. So, we would have to figure out how this interaction happens. The stability of the cell cell or cell matrix assembly uh, can be enhanced by formation of uh, these cell junctions. Right. So, instead of just having physical uh, attachments, physical uh, non-specific physical forces, if you can have these uh, specific junctions which are formed, then you are going to have much tighter and much stronger uh, interactions. So, there are different classes of these cell junctions. So, the first type is called as a tight junction. You also have anchoring junctions and uh, communicating junctions. So, we will quickly go through what these are. So, uh, a tight junction is basically or something where closely associated areas of two cells whose membranes are joined together form a virtually impermeable barrier to a fluid. So, this is a very tight interconnected uh, junction. So, the transmembrane proteins interact with each other to form a very strong protein complex. So, here both the cells are contributing equally. So, you would have uh, the receptors and ligands are interacting from both cells at an equal level. So, uh, this allows molecules to move against concentration gradient that is the importance of having these tight junctions. It is not just diffusion through which it is going it can active transport of molecules is possible through this tight junction. Okay. So, uh, permeability of tight junction uh, decreases logarithmically with protein density in the junction. So, uh, because it is like dependent on the concentration of the proteins it will be first order uh, mechanism. So, it will you will have uh, exponential increase and logarithmic decrease and so on right. So, uh, you would have to uh, see that you would see that as the number of uh, tight junction a uh, number of proteins or the protein density at the junction increases you are going to have significant reduction in the permeability, but it will become much stronger interaction thereby uh, helping in uh, crossing the barrier like uh, helping in transfer from lower concentration to a higher concentration. So, anchoring junctions are the ones where the protein complex uh, is formed by where the cells are actually mechanically attached to another cell or matrix. So, this usually consists of two portions. The first one is the intracellular attachment of proteins which connect the cytoskeleton to the membrane and then there is a transmembrane linker protein which tethers the membranes between the cells. So, uh, the attachment occurs when this transmembrane protein binds to the complementary uh, protein in the adjacent cell or the matrix. So, uh, this basically acts as a mechanical link like a hook which has been connected right. So, now you uh, so this is now connected to the cell intracellular transmembrane protein and then there is a an intracellular attachment proteins which connects it to the cytoskeleton. So, it is now kind of hooked to the surface. So, these are some of the anchoring junctions. So, as you can see uh, you are identified there are some of these shown here you have the desmosomes, you have adherence and you have the hemidesmosomes. So, these are the different uh, anchoring junctions which can actually be uh, formed. So, uh, anchor this is the overview of the anchoring junctions. So, if you are talking about uh, adherence 
the transmembrane protein which is involved is a cadran and the uh, extracellular ligand is also a cadran. So, the intracellular linkage uh, which is the intracellular protein accessory protein which is present would be actin fibers. Uh, in case of desmosomes you would have cadran cadran interaction however the intracellular uh, linkage is intermediary filaments which are present in the cell. Uh, hemidesmosomes uh, are not cadran dependent they form uh, uh, interactions based on with the integrins and an ECM protein and so uh, what you can identify from that is adherence and desmosomes are usually used in cell cell interactions whereas hemidesmosome is uh, the type of anchoring junction which is formed between a cell and a matrix okay so uh, again intermediate filaments are uh, involved in the intracellular linkage so focal contact is basically an integrin ecm uh, protein junction which is an actin, actin filament acts as the intracellular linkages so integrins are uh, and cadrins are usually involved in these uh, types of anchoring junctions so adherins uh, are basically adherin junctions are the type of junctions which connect actin filaments to either the matrix or the cell and the junctions usually are composed of cadrins which are transmembrane proteins that form uh, homodimers in a calcium dependent manner so cadrins uh, require calcium to form these uh, to be active and uh, p120 uh, binds the uh, membrane region of the cadran and uh, beta catenin binds the uh, catenin binding region of the cadran binds to the catenin uh, bind, binding region of the cadran and alpha catenin binds the cadran indirectly via the beta, beta catenin or uh, to the cytoskeleton or to the uh, placoglobin which would be the intermediary filaments and links it to the actin with the cadran okay so these are just the structure so the mechanism like uh, the understanding of this uh, details of this is probably not very crucial uh, for tissue engineering applications but what is more important is to understand uh, how these are formed uh, or like what are the receptors and ligands which are involved in these things which can be tried to apply to uh, tissue engineering applications so desmosomes and hemidesmosomes uh, are also uh, anchorage uh, anchoring junctions so in case of desmosomes what you see is uh, a connection between the intermediate filaments uh, to the adjacent cells the intermediate filaments are usually made of uh, fibrous proteins that form uh, much of the structural framework of the cells so some of these are, uh, would be keratin or vimentin or desmin so these are just fibrous proteins which are present to create these uh, structural framework so the connections here again are mediated by cadrans okay so the um, the two these two things so the uh, cadran uh, the adherens and uh, desmosomes are cadran dependent anchoring uh, junctions so hemidesmosomes are integrin dependent anchorage uh, anchoring junctions so here what happens is uh, there is a connection of the basal surface of the cells uh, by means of uh, intermediary filaments <coughs> So, uh, these interact with the extracellular matrix uh, to form uh, the junctions okay. So, uh, hemidesmosomes they, these are some of the uh, representations of how these interactions actually happen okay. So, uh, this uh, these are the receptors. So, uh, if you look at the major receptors, cell adhesion receptors which are exposed, they can be categorized as uh, into four major uh, groups integrins, uh, Ig like uh, CAM or cadrans or selectins, right. So, these have different structures, and uh, depending on which cell type you are working with, uh, one or more of them can be overexpressed. So, you can design your scaffolds appropriately. So, uh, basically these um, four are can again be classified uh, grouped as two major things one is the calcium dependent and the other is the calcium independent uh, receptors. The uh, cell adhesion molecules uh, which come under calcium dependent would be the integrins, cadrins and selectins. Uh, immunoglobin like receptors or the IgCAM receptors 
are uh, calcium independent. So, integrins are calcium dependent uh, proteins which are involved in cell matrix adhesion, uh, but some can actually be involved in cell cell adhesion as well. Uh, so, what happens here is there is a heterodimeric membrane protein uh, which consists of non covalently associated alpha and beta subunits. So, this is the structure of the uh, integrin and the binding is actually very specific. It binds to uh, collagen and laminin uh, through the alpha 1 beta 1 integrin and through whereas to fibro fibronectin through alpha 5 beta 1 uh, integrin. Okay. So, depending on the uh, two subunits you can actually have different specificity for uh, attachment. So, uh, so, if you are talking about this transmembrane protein uh, this connects the cell to the external environment and the extracellular domain uh, basically binds to the ECM protein and the in, uh, cytoplasmic domain uh, binds to the cytoskeleton in the cell. Okay. So, this way you actually have proper interaction within the cell with the uh, matrix. RGD is one of the uh, ligands which interacts with integrin. So, many ECM uh, molecules contain RGD domains. So, these are this is very popular fibronectin actually contains a lot of RGD so does uh, collagen and laminin and even keratins and so on. So, uh, cell binding through this RGD domain is uh, often through mediated through integrins and uh, so people have actually this was one of the early uh, peptides which were used for improving cell adhesion. So, when you are looking at uh, modifying cells uh, like material surfaces people are trying to attach RGD domains or incorporate RGD domains as part of this uh, matrix or try to use molecules which would have these RGD domains use proteins which would have RGD domains uh, to prepare these scaffolds. So, that way they were trying to improve cell adhesion. So, uh, it can also be used to reduce uh, cell adhesion if you were to use RGD as a soluble RGD in uh, the media. So, if you want to uh, just move it away from the scaffold, but that is also that might be required if you are looking for uh, like some kind of separation using this uh, like cell separation. So, where you say that uh, cells which do not express uh, receptors for RGD uh, ligands should be adhered whereas, the cells which actually uh, express these receptors should be in suspension. So, if you want to do something like that then you would use RGD in, in solution thereby uh, preventing adhesion of these cells. Okay. Cadrons are again calcium dependent uh, binding. So, these yeah. Can you give an example of why that would be required using RGD to prevent? Uh, so, uh, you remember we talked about cell isolation. So, during that time I was saying one of the things which can be done is to uh, selective adhesion to surfaces or selective separation. So, this would be one of those applications. So, uh, I have read that RGD motif is uh, widely used in bone tissue engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, is it uh, how is it actually? So, basically fibroblasts uh, all types of fibroblasts actually uh, have uh, like uh, receptors which will interact with RGD. Osteoblasts are uh, can be can uh, have similar uh, surface really they are they are more like fibroblasts present in a bone tissue right. So, because of that reason they actually adhere nicely to RGD. So, this can be seen with chondrocytes uh, many of these uh, types of cells have uh, integrins which can bind to RGD. So, that is why people try to use that and uh, so these uh, these materials can these cells are uh, advantageous because they can also secrete their own matrix like fibroblasts and osteoblasts uh, or chondrocytes they secrete their own matrix. So, if you have adhere them so as your matrix as the scaffold you use gets degraded over a period of time you would have new matrix formed because these uh, these cells are depositing their matrix. So, that is why they try to optimize it that way. Okay. Okay, so, uh, if you are talking about um, cadrons these are uh, in mostly involved in cell cell binding and uh, unlike integrins, integrins are mainly involved in cell matrix bindings. 
So, uh, these are transmembrane proteins which consist of about 700 amino acids. They contain uh, 5 extracellular repeat domains which are called as the CAD domains and uh, 3 calcium binding regions. Uh, this the, they contain a membrane uh, spanning region which is the transmembrane region and then a cytoplasmic region which typically binds to the actin filaments in your cell. The CAD domain consists of a histidine alanine uh, valine domain. Uh, which regulates the binding. Okay. So, just like how RGD is, uh, is one of the ligands, here the domain itself contains this uh, histidine alanine valine uh, combination d domain. Okay. So, there are different classes you have E cadrons, which are the epithelial cadrons, P cadrons, which are placental and epidermal cadrons, and uh, you have N cadrons, which are seen in nerve cells, lenses, and uh, heart cells. So, the dominant mechanism, this is the most dominant mechanism for cell cell interactions. Selectins are again calcium dependent bindings, uh, these are usually expressed in a transient way, these are not uh, very uh, involved in regular cell adhesion process. So, these are typically expressed on the surface of endothelial cells that line the artery walls and uh, they contain a lectin domain which recognizes the specific oligosaccharides expressed on the surface of neutrophils. So, thereby they can actually attract neutrophils when there is an inflammation. Right. So, this is over expressed only at that point. So, the neutrophils will bind, migrate and eventually transmigrate through the vessel wall to participate in the inflammatory response. So, that is where uh, selectins play a cru crucial role. Uh, the Ig cams or the immunoglobulin like receptors uh, contain one or more domains that have structural similarity to the immunoglobulin molecules. And uh, these again mediate cell cell interactions, uh, these are calcium independent binding. There are two major classes, there is a N CAMS and I CAMS. N CAM is when uh, involved in neural cell adhesion, whereas I CAMS are involved in other intercellular uh, adhesion molecules. So, uh, N CAMS are present in many cells, however, they are primarily seen in uh, nerve cells. These bind uh, cells by using homophilic interactions uh, of NCAMs, uh, whereas ICAMs are expressed in activated endothelial sites, uh, in the endothelial cells and these bind integrins on the leukocytes uh, by heterophilic mechanisms. So, they provide a uh, very fine control of uh, cell adhesion. So, depending on uh, the structure of uh, the immunoglobulin which is present, they can actually selectively attach uh, to cells and so on. So, uh, so we looked at what the cells uh, do. So, the other side of it is uh, what are the ligands which are present on the matrices, we try to understand that to emulate cell adhesion uh, in tissue engineering. So, we had already looked at what uh, ECM is, ECM is made up of different things, proteins, proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans. So, glycosaminoglycans could be uh, hyaluronan, uh, chondritin sulphate, dermatan sulphate, heparin sulphate, keratin sulphate and so on. And you could have uh, proteoglycans or uh, and proteins such as collagen, fibronectin, laminin, elastin, and uh, tennosin, vitro uh, vitronectin, thrombospondin, and many other things. Okay. So, uh, depending on what is uh, present, each of them would have different ligands which will help in attachment of uh, cells. The uh, glycosaminoglycans are usually high molecular weight uh, polysaccharides which typically form the ABN, it is a polydisaccharide, uh, right. So, your uh, hyaluronic acid is a disaccharide, uh, a polydisaccharide and so on. So, uh, one sugar residue is always an amino sugar and uh, the second residue is typically a uronic sugar. Uh, so, usually an uronic acid such as glucuronic acid and so on. So, these are unbranched, inflexible and highly water soluble, what, uh, they are very highly hydrophilic and uh, they are highly sulfated as well, therefore, they have a lot of negative charges. So, this induces migration of positive charges into the matrix creating osmotic forces that uh, ensure that the tissue is hydrated. And uh, they can, these are the molecules which are used to form hydrogels even at very low concentrations. So, hyaluronic acid is one example for that, it has been shown to uh, help in uh, embryogenesis, tissue repair and uh, it also facilitates cell migration. 
So, proteoglycans uh, are proteins that possess uh, glycosaminoglycans uh, linked okay, using some kind of a linker protein. So, they possess an extremely high sugar content which could be about 95 percent of their weight because the glycosaminoglycans are very large polymers which can be attached to these uh, proteins. So, they are very highly heterogeneous structures and uh, take part in many functions. They can act as reservoirs for signaling molecules or mediators for addition of cell membranes uh, or size or charge filters for the molecules which are crossing. So, proteins as I have mentioned collagen is just the most abundant protein uh, in ECM. There are different types of collagen and they are present in different regions. You have laminin, uh, laminin has non-specific binding, laminin is one of the proteins which has very high amount of RGD domain. Fibronectin also has RGD domains which help in uh, integrin mediated cell addition. So, other things are elastin, tenacin, uh, vetronectin and thrombospondin. Uh, all of these are involved in different aspects and many of them have RGD binding sites. So, as you see RGD is a very ubiquitous uh, uh, ligand seen in many of the matrix components. So, that is why it has been uh, extensively studied. So, if you were to look up uh, strategies to improve cell addition, uh, attaching RGD uh, peptide would be one of the most common strategies. Okay. So